Mwekhamar, Shwe Eri Akrosok. Arten Nishanla, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Walk the Crossroads. This is your host, Padre Gossi, a.k.a. Shouted Sin, and last time we did an overview of the nobility of the first estate, the noble houses, the pharaoh that carved up society after the coming of the mega corporations and the blood declaration written by Baal Aken and his conspirators at the end of the first expansion era. This time we'll be talking about the second estate in a multi-parter, because of how detailed this information is, we will be covering the various religions of Avalon and how they play into the world today. The second estate is a very complex notion. We're just going to do a quick overview before we dive into the Oberonish religions. One of the major aspects of society and how it was carved into what it is today was this notion of the ancestors, the, the uh, figures that came before, the race that came before. The, uh, this is those who are known as the Enfaryog, the immortals, those who, those who basically created Altir as it was, and those who actually exiled and then came to rule the Pharaoh for a short time in a group known as the Immortal Dynasties. Because of this, there's many swear words such as Sezram, ancestors, by the stars, the stars take you, that just deal with this notion of what was lost and why the Pharaoh and the later races were exiled to the Avalon Cluster. The major religious groups that we're going to be talking about tonight are the Oberonish religions, and this is the creed and its associated faiths, transtheism, and the major Duxianity. And the new insurgent faith known as its Kachana, or the path of the or the feathered serpent's path. All right, guys, let's jump in and just do a little bit of a descriptive here. Oberon's religions can be quite different, but they're often based upon the notion of rule known via the, what is called the right of ice and fire, the right given by High King Oberon of Altir and his wife Titania to the Pharaoh themselves. Their name Pharaoh does come from the elder tongue. Fera, which means the fated ones. Now let's talk a little bit about the creed. The creed is one of the oldest religions. It was founded by a figure known as Apollo the Prevester, a man who basically took a bunch of disparate cults and united them under one general canon, which came to be known as the Curving or the Remembrance. Credans, as they are called, are organized into two major factions. We have the Silver Creed, which is a bit like the Catholic Church, and they are the oldest of the various um, creating uh, sex. They um, they are found across various parts. They are known as the Silver Crusade, the Paladine Choir. Their leader is the Silver Seer, who is elected by the Silver Curia, and their um, holy book is the Testament. Their deities are the Great Four Star Gods, the High King, who represents a sort of judging figure the High Queen, who is sort of a merciful, yet at the very same time, a protector of the body, but also, again, kind of a matronly judge. Then you have the Lord Jack, who represents thieves, those who want to make decisions and kind of a rebellious concepts. And then you have the merciful the uh, the Blessed Maiden, or the Blessed Maid, who basically oversees mercy and c provides a sense of caring. The final god, who is not part of the major group of star gods, is the Void. The Void's job is to effectively represent atrophy, but also the the fifth primordial, or not correction, the fourth primordial known as Abyss, who himself is the Lord of Entropy in the all-tier cosmology, which has been imparted to the Creed. Now, the Silver Creed is a little complicated, but basically they believe that all live in sin. The Pharaoh were cast out of paradise because they defied the star gods. Via the star gods, Avalon was willed into existence. Uh, Apollo the Prebister is the true prophet, and he believes in a grand vision, and through this grand vision, one can become saved. And through moderation and good action, you can also be rid yourself of original sin, and through righteous treatment of or the order of life, one can be part of the Prebister's vision. There is this concept known as prayer and witnessing, which is every few days one goes and participates at the local testament, that is the holy house. Um, they often ring bells. There's also prayer and rituals, which is the holy perception. There's a lot of this concept of the priest or no, the person individual knows the parson who tries to kind of give a sense of what the star gods are trying to do. 
The central text is the curving. It is a very complicated text. It is split between the elder and younger witness. Um, each witness is filled with an epic. The epic often tell major stories, such as the Lament of the Skies and the Epic of Perun. Perun's daughter, Ilyana, is killed by by poison by a member of the House of Poseidon. He then carefully wove a web of deceit and lies that undid the powerful family until it lay nearly in ruins. This is this concept that you tell stories of the epic actions of your ancestors and then you use that as a means to interpret and how you should act in the modern day. There are multiple versions of the curving depending upon what sect of the the creed we're talking about. There's several sects altogether. And because of that, we're going to now move away but before we do that, let's quickly talk about the Silver Ecclesia. The Ecclesia is basically the leading uh, group of individuals and priests. They're known as... Um, there are... Let me see here. The they have the Silver Ecclesia is made up of people who are taught at a, pl a place known as the Gigsa, kind of like a seminary. They become parsons. The parsons then answer to bishops who then, el who then elect a... A, a representative of their own to go to the primary holy city of Toscana and represent the bishopric to the silver seer themselves. There are two ecclesiastical departments. There's the Department of Tithes, which is seen by the Hierarch of Treasures, and they collect local donations of the parishes, and they basically represent sort of the sense of the funds. Then you have the Department of Inquiry. The Department of Inquiry is the internal watchdog enforcement group that across the Silver Creed, and they're composed of the Decanus, the ten judge, the judges of ten witnesses, and its leader, the Hierarch Decanus, is charged with executing serial bulls and acts of excommunication. Basically, if you don't want to get in the face of the Spanish Inquisition, do not get the interest of the Department of Inquiry. There are two major active religious sects within the Silver Creed. There's the Order of Prester Jonas. Jonas was one of the many different saints, and what he did is he founded an order who basically goes around and they fight corruption um, across the Silver Creed, but one of their primary focuses is spreading the word. They also kind of act as a bit like the Jesuits. They go around and they kind of even come to undermine various groups and they can cause problems. They're they're basically kind of like uh, they're warrior monks without the warrior notion, but they also can be quite um, aggressive in their directive. The second active one is the Ishtari Sisterhood. The Ishtari are warrior priestesses, and their entire purpose is to defend the holy lands and relics of the Silver Creed and other faiths. They're very strange that they're found across the entire triad and beyond, and they are only found in places where holy areas or sacred ground is. They're also very secretive. The third holy sect, the Mercurial Brotherhood, was banned, supposedly, under the creation of the Ban of Gwyn. They were the official assassins. Now, we're going to take a step away, as I mentioned before, and we're going to talk a bit about what are known as the Controvert Creed. Controvert Creed was founded by um, Martin the Scholar when he wrote a series of theses. Kind of, effectively, what he was doing is that he was it was concerning the canonization of the curving itself, what kind of epics were included, but also how the the uh, basically the Ecclesia was acting above the lay people in in the concept of spiritual purity. There was also different factions that already existed in the Silver Creed that broke away and formed their own independent creeds to uh, basically lead themselves differently, such as the Crimson Creed that believes that only nobility should lead, or the White Creed, which is more of a... Um, kind of a non... They, they have their own group, and they tend to believe in only blood inheritance. And then you have the Emerald Creed, which are led by women. So... Effectively, the Silver Creed splits in action in a kind of the Great Schism, or, or it's also known as the Divine Declaration. But often, many people simply call it the Controversion, the Denial. People who deny what has been written. This led to different uh, concepts. They often argued over purity, such as um, many people in Silver Creed believe that the Prevester was divine. Uh, many people who are controverts do not believe the Prevester is divine. Um, many, and for this very act, the Silver Creed often calls the controvert the Great Denial, and they often call them deniers in some cases. Leadership, as I mentioned, is a big deal, and there are, as I said, there are three major groups. We have the White Creed, who are a, a kind of an ethnic group. They're, they are the Karana. They're known as Wittens. They are, they're found throughout the entire area. They are often heavily hunted. They have their own little kind of a, 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 a sect, um... 
their own little additional bit of information, um, not uh, information, but written known as the Cravinta Vorbin, and we'll get more into these guys later, but it kind of goes down to how they conduct, um, it's kind of like a rule series of conducts and kind of a religious law they found it, a bit like rabbinical law. The Emerald Creed, on the other hand, is found throughout Roshalka and Magmel, or I mean, uh, Piar Gzog, <laughs> which is the kind of Hungarian-like people. They're known as Meraldans. Meraldans are very interesting as they focus a lot on keeping relics, and they're very big on idols and imagery. They uh, are led by a grand matriarch, and they have a matriarchate of the church, and in some cases this can be very, very, very independent. They are um, well known because they often fought valiantly for their freedom against the Singing Blades of the Mercurio Brothers, and they were very vocal about this. Um, and their founder is Grand Matriarch Elizabeth the Fourth of House Emissary. Nothing to do with the uh, with um, the House Emissary from the Rain Power. Very interesting thing to note is that the official names of a lot of these groups are very very impressive. So, like for example, the Emerald Creed's official name is the Sacrifant, Sas, Sacrosant Testament of Creeds. The official name for the Silver Creed is the True. I believe is the one second here. It won't take that long to find it. They have a very interesting name. Their official name is the Ecumeral Testament of the Silver Creed. So, as you guys can see, the con the Creedans are a very kind of almost... I'm going uh, to say all religions in this game are kind of pompous, but they kind of have a sense of this testament. They believe the testament is kind of who they are. That's why their holy houses are called testaments. That goes down to this concept that one has given testament in the word of the gods. So here we go. The White Creed calls itself the True Testament of the White Creed, and then the Crimson Creed is called the Testament of Stars. These guys are interesting in that they have placed a very heavy emphasis on ancestral bloodlines, and they also are kind of interesting in that they have dervishes. They also go to they also encourage pilgrimages to local saints and they're more of a confederation of local congregations rather than one gigantic, you know, central denomination, which makes them very different. So, as you guys can see, the Credans have a very interesting history for the very fact that they were founded by this immortal individual who people even to this day question his status as a god. And out of this was born, you know, four major faiths that still argue to this day about who has power, who is divine, who should lead, and who in general is interpreting this one book, The Curvine, um, correctly. Now, let's talk a bit about the transtheetic trans religions, or techno-religions. These things popped up around the Middle Eras, during the time when the Cisnet was really kind of becoming more and more important. This led to the existence of what comes to be known as the High Apostolic Duxian Nexus, or what many people seem to call it, the Duxian Church. The Duxian Church is the only existing major techno uh, faith still there. It is effectively the result of a strange biosynthetic individual. We don't even know where he, he or she or it, I'm gonna, I hate the word it, So or where they come from because the Dukes was noticeably... Um, they're gendered, or even just simply androgynous. There was no notable gender. They were actually agendered. And what happens is that the Dukes comes out, and this kind of what happens is he, they take this notion of the voidism, you know, the concept of colonial independence of the stars, and they take this even further, and they start professing this idea that when one dies, one can be raised to ancestorhood, or the, the, con the to the level of the ancestors by effectively going through an act known as apotheosis where you take the soul of someone and you upload it at their death into the cisnet by it, so they come become a god. These They have a few central beliefs, such as prayer. They think everybody should pray every day to, um, to, the, to the dukes. You are required to give alms to people who need it. There's a very strong sense of community. This is known as the membership of the Duxian, of the Duxian Church. They believe in this concept of the, of, the, of the divine ancestors. The divine ancestors being split into two major choirs. The choirs themselves are very interesting in the fact that you have this sort of what are called the heroic legends, and these are the Fate Mother, a sort of last surviving member of the, la of the last great ancients. Many people could say this is the High Queen in a different guise. Then you have the Silver Spear, a sort of heroic, a giver of heroic deeds and justice, probably the High King. Then you have the River Speed, is said to watch over travelers of old, and a song keeps them safe. Again, another reinterpretation, probably the the 
the the beloved maid, and then you have the forge master who is said to be disfigured and have a mighty muscular body. He's a lord of all smiths, keeper of the great arsenal, and sharpen the weapons of the silver spear. This could be a reinterpretation of the little lord Jack or a new god entirely. Then you have the honor ones. You have these various levels of still existing souls who exist in what's known as the after realm, the sort of uh, holo simulation or kind of even an online game where the Psy souls or the uh, the ghosts of the uploaded are prevented from going mad because of the extensive amount of memory they acquire over time. The fourth belief in because we're jumping back to belief is divinity. Only only the divine ancestors are divine, so they definitely deny the dukes being divine. Through the teachings of the dukes, I mean, well, not the dukes being divine. I mean, the prebister. Through the teachings of the duke, one can become saved. So again, here's another emphasis on this notion of being saved. The um the the Oberonish religions are very heavy on this notion of salvation. The other religions don't really care about this, but the Oberon the Oberonish believers are very big about we were exiled, we must be saved somehow. They are also um their seventh tenet is or axiom is acceptance and equality, which basically means that one must be respected even if you don't believe in the faith, which is kind of contradictory. Their major um. Holy Text is the Great Remembrance, and the Great Remembrance is split into what are known as the Old, the Grand, and the Later Memories. The Old Memories are kind of writings of effectively what goes on of when the Duke started telling stories. The Grand Memories are then what happens to the Dukes before he was killed by the Silver Seer. The Latter Memories are then the history of the Blessed Disciples, the Seven Blessed Disciples. These are the Dukes' followers who are trying to organize and discuss what their their faith is about. So, and they actually wrote that down in the um the disciples. So, I mean in the in these two great synods in this uh in a colony known as Sons Redoubt, what actually is now the holy city of Sons Redoubt. So, the membership is very interesting in that it is the technological teachings of the Deuce considered a member of the house of the Nexus. So, basically everybody who is or goes to a Nexium, the holy houses of the Duxian faith are considered members of the of the membership, and the interesting thing is that they actually call outsiders Luddites, you know, kind of a, a, a term that means someone who doesn't really have faith in technology. So, they also have a concept of what they call sanctuary, which means one can, um, and they can commune with the spirits, and then they also have bi-weekly meetings where, um, where they kind of gather and they perform a me- remembrance of things, even taking in wayward orphans and souls and other people who may just get mass blessings by priests. The one the other one other thing to note is that they're one of their biggest um their more interesting and biggest rituals is the what's known as the basically is apotheosis. Apotheosis means that someone is effectively dying and what they do is they're brought to this large machine, which often is called the Hand of Goetia, and an individual called a caretaker will come forward, and their job therein is to upload that individual's mind onto the cisnet. This is a mixture of the puppeteer technology used to switch bodies, known as doppelgangers, and the technology used to transfer the, the mind of someone into a pariah doll, soul-given, synthetic body. They took this, and they basically made it so someone can then upload their minds into it, and they effectively have created an online heaven where people can even commune with these individuals. And there are some of them known as Furies, uh, part of the Lesser Choir, who go around even actively defend and even hack the enemies of of the Duxian Church. There are two major uh, political, um, so religious sects. We're going to cover them in just a second. I'm going to quickly note is that the Duxian Church is led by a group known as the Great Synod, and this comes from the first and second Great or Grand Synods, which were founded by the Blessed Disciples. Effectively, how things work is that there are what they call networks, you know, kind of the collection of local nexiums. The they rule through a system of consent. The lesser synods of the Nexus allow a hierarch, which is someone they elect or they they choose to basically go and then represent them in the Great Synod. And then the Hierarchs call upon their suborn Exarchs to lead through um, sort of the the consensus of the lay people. So what you basically get is every um, network is represented by a Hierarch, and then there are 
exarchs that are in charge of each next each nexium. Now, the hierarchs can at times elect an individual known as the patriarch, which is older lore and is not generally something seen here. But there is um, the thing to note is that let's see, here we go. Um, Perhaps one of the grand example of heresy, and we're going to mention a little bit of heresy here because this is something that I, we didn't really talk about in the Creed, is, just reading this from the wiki, perhaps one grand example of heresy occurred in the modern era when several noble families moved the shield power away from the hierarchs themselves. The axe precise time was forgotten in history, but has become known as the Knight of Seven Sins. During the rule of an exarch found in the outer room of Sentinel, it is said that members of the Devil Kin struck a deal with the Fool. In turn, the exarch broke away from the home network and declared themselves the second coming of the Dukes. A heretical prophecy that then led to a mass massacre under the steely control of the Reavers Guild. Ever since when, then whenever heretical ideas violently strike the High Nexus, the Synod elects a Hierophant to lead all, to lead a holy inquiry to reap out dangerous elements to the membership. So, I wanted to read that off because it brings up one of the more interesting aspects of the Great Synod. So, if any of you guys know a little bit about the history of Rome, they, before the coming of Caesar and the establishment of the Empire... The Republic had the ability to effectively elect this individual known as a tyrant. A tyrant would have about a set amount of time and when they had absolute power to accomplish a certain goal, and then they gave up their power. The Hierophant is effectively a tyrant. They are elected by the Hierarchs and the Exarchs to come forward, and they go through the entire thing, the entire religion, and they, they sit for heretics, or they lead a crusade of defense. Their job is to effectively defend and keep corruption from latching on to the high nexus. For this very reason, their emblem is a hung crook, kind of like a uh, hung crook being a sort of a, a shepherd's crook. And they and they cannot... Um, the thing to note is that they cannot imprison people without just cause, and they are often at odds with local, um, local authorities. And they are the only ones that can bring people for trials of excommunication and call for member removal of the membership in general. So unlike the uh, the Creed, or the Silver Creed in particular, the, the High Nexus cannot remove someone from their membership unless it's elected. So, as a, so we're going to quickly just cover this once again. The networks are made up of what are called lesser synods. The lesser synods are, rep are made up of representatives known as exarchs that represent each individual nexium. These individuals then elect and choose via consensus a hierarch who then goes to the great synod to represent that network as a constituency. So, let's talk a little bit about the religious sects. We have the true clarity protocol who bleeds through justice we find clarity. These guys are uh, are a bit like are a bit like warrior you know techno monks. They believe that they um, they were basically founded by the blessed disciple Serpent Eye of the AR. They are former members of the Reavers Guild who converted to the word of the Dukes when on sabbatical. This was um, who he is. Now these guys effectively are a loose lines of defense. They they defend not only the online elements but they also defend the uh, the notions of the Dukes itself and the Dukesian church. They often go out and try to proselytize, and they go out and they try to compete with other religions for the souls of the faithful. They are organized in a more secular manner, with, and they have awarded record, directors with local supervisors that oversee the fleet of missionary ships that ply the star winds. The entire leader is the is the protocol is the of this, this entire protocol is the Archon, and their official title is the Archon of Clarity. And to note, they have a command cruiser, or basically a large ship, known as the Apostolic Justice. They're found in the Outer Rim colonies primarily, and they mostly act in Sentinel and the Southern Reaches. So these guys are are very likely in direct conflict with its Kachana, and we'll be talking about those guys in a moment. Okay? The next group of individuals are the caretakers, or the Goetia Administrative Protocol. Their leader is the Archon of, Go of Goetia, and they are, uh, they are found in the great trans, the high trans archives of Sons Redoubt. So trans archives are an undercrop found in all Nexiums. They are where the caretakers of the GAP, or the GAP, yes I know, the GAP are located. These are the individuals who oversee, maintain, and, and basically conduct the ritual of apotheosis. They're the ones who manage and, and, and use the hand of Goetia to apotheosis or apothesize someone into the after realm. They also control, manage, and maintain the grand servers that 
that create the private network known as the After Realm, and they're the ones who also go through and try to defend it if anyone tries to hack into it. Okay? So now, we've covered two of the Oberonish religions, and now we're going to again take another step back, and we're going to talk about the religion known as Itzkachana. Now, before we jump into Itzkachana, I want to really note that it's, Itzkachana is interesting in that it has a lot of words that are not going to be English compared to before. So, f before we begin, we're going to note that Itzkachana is a Mesoamerican-influenced individual. So, there's going to be a mixture of Incan, Mayan, and Aztec words used to kind of create this feeling. So, for those of you who get interested, Itzkachana effectively is a hodgepodge of different languages and peoples that sprung up out of the fall of, of, a, of an island, of a planet, not an island, I don't want to say an island, a planet known as Michelin. Michelin was destroyed and bombarded during the Void War, and many of its people fled into the southern reaches. One group eventually goes and becomes the AR Cabal of the, of the Arashi, and they found the Reavers Guild. The rest are fled, and they found what becomes known as the Itzyua kingship. These guys are the primary believers of Itzkachana. As the wiki entry says, through the teachings of Itzkana and his chosen, the Sapakana, the way of the Katoons shall be read across all the four corners. Now, as a quick history lesson, when the, when the, the survivors of Michelin fled, they effectively started... Um, they started basically colonizing a series of planetoids in this large Cooper belt in the south known as the Southern Reaches. Over time, they were able to get a sense of control, a sense of life, and they were then, once again, at the mercy of the Gwagara. These guys were the, were the Wormkin, and after dealing with the Wormkin for many years, this man, known simply as Itzkana, appeared out of nowhere with a bunch of technology and this these books and this word of God and these strange powers, most likely tech or genic abilities, and he goes to basically found a religion which becomes known as the Faithful Way of the Blessed Rain, or simply It's Kachana. So, the central uh, founder is Itzkana, who is an individual who brings a series of technologies in Revelation. He creates the great Mecca known as the Waka. He also brings a lot of other things, and it was through him bringing these technologies to the south that effectively allowed the followers of Itzkachana, which are known as the Ikpatan, to push away and defeat the various tribes of the Wormkin. Now, the the thing to note here is that Itzkachana is a is a protestalizing converting religion like the rest of the Oberonish religions, but is very very aggressive about it. It is a mixture of political and religious, so it's a bit like the early days of Islam or the early days of the Pope, for a comparison. So let's talk a little bit about their beliefs and practices. Their central writings are known as the Katoons. These are the cycles. Um, they have a series of cycles, such as the Katoon of Red Luster, the Katoon of the Serpent, and they basically, like the other holy, uh, holy scriptures, have a series of stories and epics that are to inspire people to do things or to understand how the world works. Their primary gods are known as the Aku. These guys effectively believe that the Aku, their main, um, their main uh, pantheon, is the oldest and the truest of any pantheon, and that they are the direct descendants of Lord and Lady of the Ice and Fire. Again, here's this concept of the, of the rule of Ice and Fire. They are said to even outrank the Star Gods or even the greatest of ancestors. These are Tikab, Lord of the Mountains and Heights and Bringer of the Luscious Rains, Inte, the Great King of the Skies and the Keeper of the Stars, Kokopati, the goddess of the thousand lakes and queen of the user of fertile soul song. These primary gods, the three main gods, are known as the august divinities. Then you have the five hollowed sanctities. Balam, lord of the jungle. Siwar Ka'enti, lord of transference. Matsla, she who dances in the rays of the moon. Chok, god of storms, purveyor of the winds. Chico, his twin, goddess of plenty and patron spirit of hard spirits. Finally, Kicha, daughter of Ante and goddess of the seas. Against the, the Aku stand the Hellions, who are led by Kazin, the destroyer. The Hellions also have various little um, lesser spirits that follow them, known as the Supe. 
the the and because of this, you have the Hellions were locked away in what is known as the lesser form of the Pacha. Now, before I discuss more about the Hellions, I'm going to describe and tell what the hell the Pacha are. These are the perceptions. This is where we're getting a little bit more confusing because it's Kachana starts using words that make things a little more out there. So, this is where we get into the more complicated notion. So this is what's called the laws of the Gaku or the universal laws. These are Ilanche, the radiate the uh, to radiate with sanctity of the gods. Ilanche is the belief that one says only Aku exists and all other systems are false. Kawase, this is the energy that alights the universe and radiates along these ley lines, which are known as um Elu. Okay? So out from the center of the universe or the center of the faith in Klan, in the Itsu kingship, sits the it's a radiates, the Elu, these lines, these lines of energy. One then can get power from your generation, known as Ilya, from the Elu, and by walking them, they can encourage healing of the soul, and through hard belief, one can never be undeterred, says the universal laws. Then you have Ilaria, which is one radiates with the light. When one begins to radiate when the energy, one causes one to shine. You must bring the light of this rain to everybody else. Then you have Amaru to have knowledge of the cartoons and the great works of the Yaku. Finally, Anka Re, Anka K, the peace or the unification that is brought to all when all become a member of the Ikpatan. So, because of this, we're going to quickly talk about a little bit more about what the laws of the Yaku specifically are. There's more than the six laws. The six laws also set down the shamanic tradition of the leaders of the priesthood known as the Chana. And this is how they see things. There are levels of realm, realms or planes known as perceptions, which are often called Pacha. The first one being Ukho Pacha, the place where Kazin and his Hellions are trapped forever. They will eventually someday break out in, in, current, in the time known as the Time of Last Tears and battle with the followers of the Aku. The next level is where everybody resides, and that is simply the second level. The third level is Kepacha, the perception of all minor kana or priests. This is basically everybody who is a genic is at this level. The fourth level is for mid-level or higher-ranked kana of the priesthood, and is often associated with the cisnet. Finally, you have the fifth level of perception. The perception said to be given to those who pilot the mecha, known as Chevalier, and the Waka in combat. Then you have the sixth level for only the Halapacha and the Sapakana themselves. And this is the area where people can see into the realm of the gods known as Sibylla, where the gods reside and directly commune with them. All right. Now, the rituals of rain are very interesting. This is basically this concept of communing with the gods or traversing which is walking along the Elu, which is the simplest of, of their various rituals. You have the blessing ceremony which is conducted 30 days after a child's birth, which is a major thing. Then you have gate walking where an Ikpatan reaches the majority. They gather with the Kana and their family to walk through the gates of the rain of the local rain temple. Okay? The Aku rites themselves are another aspect. When local congregation meet at the rain temple to mediate over readings of the cartoons, they are conducting the Aku rites. So basically, when one goes to conduct or understand the cartoons, that is the Aku rites. The Chana, which is the priesthood, is interesting to note because it has a very, very complicated grouping of individuals. We anoint you with the blessed waters of the rain that runs with the power of the Elu. May you speak swiftly with the words of Kwalsh and bear the light of the Akut Welt. Before I go further, I want to note that everything in this religion is, is symbolized by Kwalsh, the feathered serpent, winged feathered serpent, whose statue is found in all of the blessed rain temples. Now... The rain temples themselves are basically, again, kind of organized in a sort of constituency setup. The Chana themselves have temple priests, which are simply the kind of the high Kana or the leaders, and then below them are lesser Kana. All Kana are always generally referred to as Ana before their names, so you have Ana Qualsh, Ana this, Ana that, and that's how you refer to them. Then you have smaller shrines, which are often seen by local maidens or shrine maidens, so a bit like the Miko of Japan. The temples of rain act as sort of, uh, they also act as a central learning center for Kana, and they're always, um, 
And anyone who can, and then this is where we're starting to get into this level of perception. Effectively, what happens is once you go beyond high kana, you have the hall, the kana hall, who are those who can see, you know, the the higher the higher levels of the various concepts, the of perception. Above them are these individuals we, we call the kana maku, who are those who can see the fifth perception, and they lead the different districts of the four corners. They are magistrates, and they rule under the way the way of the sapakana. They're not just religious figures; they're also they're also you know um, major figures in the government. So all kana can be noted for their kind of they usually wear a white headband. And their training is complete, then they're 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 redone. All of them usually adorn themselves in feather cloak, and, and it's always jade colored. They also carry all high kana also carry a carven staff that holds the images of the gods with them. Kana Hall and Kana Malku in turn carry staves banded with jade for Kana Hall and then obsidian for Kana Malku. Let's talk a little bit about about the Sapakana. The Sapakana is interesting, is much like the uh, the Silver Seer. He is a major leader. He has a lot of power. The uh, Sapakana usually has a a harem of women, and his first wife is known as the Koya. The this, he wears a mantle of the feathered crown. He also sits upon the throne of the Mountain King. He is the highest. He is the highest shaman, and the, he has the highest level of perception, and thus he hears the words of the gods. He has a direct line of power to the Aku, and is a living embodiment of the god. Inheritance of the Sapakana, one must pass the test before that them only the Sapakana is said to know the answer, a complicated issue which is often highly guarded by members of the Chana in general. The heirs of its Kana are known to be handpicked by the Kana Maku themselves, who then, upon the ascension of a new Sapakana, submit themselves for approval. This is very interesting in the fact that the Kanamaku and everything else can be displaced by the coming of a new Safakana, which means the empire of its Kachana often gets a reshuffle when a new emperor or king of the mountain throne is chosen. There are three major religious sects for this religion. There are the Jaguar Knights, the Storm Brides, and the Hummingbirds. The Jaguar Knights are effectively the holy words, holy warriors. They are known as the Knights of Balaam, and they are charged with basically effectively leading the forefront of the conquering of, of the other non-believers to bring about the unification. They are, very, they are very ferocious in battle, and they have a very specifically um, unique form of tech style known as Clashing Fang. And they are the only errants that are allowed to exist in the entirety of the Four Corners, or the Itsu kingship. They are only generally found within the borders of the Unified Lands and on the front line. They, they have two major divisions. The Claws, which are the four front so soldiers, and the technical staff of the Waka Mechs. They are not. They are often not just errants, but there are many soul given who find freedom in the Holy March to the Last Battle. Clods are often organized in groups of four or five, known as the Talon, who fall under the command of a high Kana warrior. The Fangs are the secret of assassins and ground soldiers who use their tech as a means of fighting others in hand-to-hand -hand combat. In the Ikvaton military, they are the elite shock troops by the Chana when foe proves too deadly to simply, to for a simple challenge. The Fang squads are known as Maws and often composed of six Fangs and a respective soul given bondmates. The next holy group is the Storm Brides. These are the beloved women of Chalk, one of the this part of his so called grand um you know, harem. Interesting to note is that the twins, Chalk and Chico, share the harem, and sometimes the Storm Brides will call themselves the beloved maidens of Chico which is a, a different thing. Their job is to effectively go out and spread the word of the cartoons. They are bringing about, you know, the conversion of everything through the word of, every, of, of their actual gods themselves. They fight, and then they go into the frontier. Okay, so the jaguar fights, and the storm brides bring the word of the Yaku. There are effectively two known divisions. Well, there's actually three known divisions. There's the virgins, who are um, the more violent. They're the nuns of the faith who spend their time, days main the grand internal technology, use the power of plans for the unification. It is not, 
it is often not only preserved they all they also preserve artifacts and objects but they're also cha they're also managing plans and they're basically the ones who plan where the armies are going to attack the sisters on the other hand are the oldest of the three divisions and claim descent from the ancient courtesans of michelin they're often the greatest entertainers in the southern reaches and spread the word of the cartoons via song dance and other lavicious acts they effectively convince people through manipulation the maidens on the other hand are those who travel about the entirety of the quarters and they repair and clean the local temple Temples. They're often connected to shrine maidens, and they and they and they can also speak to. Um, oh, so all of their uh, they also can provide you know friendly counsel and word to increase faith. All of these guys were led by an individual who was a female Kana Hall, who is known as a storm mistress, who then speaks directly to the Kana Koya or the Kana Maku of the order. The hummingbirds are a little bit more frightening. They're like the caretakers. They're they're basically the the undertakers of the everything. They are easily marked because they are um they they're basically their job is to war against Kazin for the souls of the faithful, and they believe that every soul is needed in the active unit, united in the entirety of known space. They are all, they are easily identified by their many colored robes and their staves, colored and lacquered of alternating colors of white, black, and gold. They are always a sight to behold. These are the followers of Siwar Kienti, the god of transference, the god of death. Their full name is the keepers of Siwar Kante, the hummingbird king. They basically no one really knows where they come from um they are said to have existed on michelin and even before some of them even say they are based upon the older story uh, older traditions of the thousand fold all that is known is that these individuals will often travel throughout the entirety of of their uh of the of the four corners and they will look for people and they will try to effectively transfer them into the cisnet, into their into the various interpretations of the cisnet that the Itzkachana people maintain. Now, unlike uh, Duke Sandy, they are not interested in doing this to everybody. They're doing this to to save people they consider martyrs, and they do this in these very these kind of large, almost cropped areas known as the halls of the quill. And they're basically done to remember the dead. They are often jars of the dead are kept. So to note, not only do they upload people, but they also maintain the sort of these large jar-filled uh, cemeteries where the dead are kept, which is very kind of macabre. And we're going to end there. Now, before I finish up this episode, I want people to kind of think about these three religions that we just quickly covered in a, as usual, a rambling manner. We have the Creed, which is one of the oldest that believes it must, you know, effectively represent the soul of the star gods. Duke Siandi, which thinks that through one's um, belief, we can become a th uh, become a god by being apothesized into the cisnet and join the rest of the ancestral divine, I mean, ancestral divinities. And then we have Itzkachana, which believes that. Everybody else in some context is wrong and that we must follow the Aku, the ones who bring about the unification by radiating the universe through the various Elu, and by taking the Elu and building great works of art, of shrines, and temples, one can then bring about the unification to free Kazin, finally defeat him, and bring about an entire unending period of peace. All of these religions were influenced by the notions of the rite of ice and fire. All of these individuals were influenced somehow as prophets to reinterpret the notion of Altair, why the why the Feyre were effectively exiled, and what led to them being placed within the Avalon Cluster. Why did the World's Gate stop working, and why did the Immortal Dynasties fall out of favor and eventually die? Thank you, everybody, for listening in on another lore episode. Thank you for listening to my ramble talks. We'll be discussing um, Jaded Path and Thousandfold next, and after that we'll be discussing the faithful excommunicate. Have a nice day, and don't forget to walk the crossroads. As the Amazons say, Fehen Shush.